So is it safe to eat food after the expiration date? This is a Healthier Michigan podcast, episode 126. Coming up, we talk about something we've all likely done a time or two in our lives, and that is to ignore the expiration date and consume a product anyway. Can it impact our health? When is it unsafe? And when is it wasteful? Welcome to a Healthier Michigan podcast. This is a podcast that's dedicated to navigating how we can all improve our health and well-being through small healthy habits we can start implementing right now. I'm your host, Chuck Gatica, and every other week we'll sit down with a certified expert. We discuss topics that cover nutrition, fitness, and a lot more. And again, on this episode, we're talking about the reliability of expiration dates and how we can approach them and reduce food waste. With us today is registered dietitian for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Shanti Apello. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Chuck. So you see this from so many different directions, you know, about, I mean, you're working with food, you're presenting food ideas and healthful ideas and wellness. But this is really interesting because when you look at food, and I know maybe it's with the holidays not too far in the rearview mirror, right? We've got stuff we bought that we thought we would consume, and maybe now we're starting to see these expiration dates kind of creep into reality. But there's a fear that if we get to the date or just a little bit beyond that somehow we're potentially going to get sick or worse, something is going to be past that expiration date. So we throw food out and the, you know, the notion that we've heard since we were little kids, it's better to be safe than sorry, right? Mm-hmm. So how do we start to approach this idea of an expiration date short of, obviously, there is one. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is a great question because expiration dates actually have nothing to do with safety. Come on. Unless it's considering infant formula. So we're going to take infant formula out of this whole conversation and focus on food. But expiration dates are not related to safety. There's, you know, the sell by date, which tells the store when they can sell it by. There's actually been a lot of push in policy to try to even hide this date to consumers because it's so confusing. You know, we see these food dates. We see best buy, sell by, use by. All of these things are guiding our buying decisions, and it's also guiding us uh, to tell us when to throw things out. But this confusion leads to so much food waste. Actually, Feeding America had a survey done, and they said that 80% of Americans discard perfectly good food because they don't understand expiration labels. And even the USDA says there's so much perfectly good food that gets wasted because we don't understand these. And it's different uh, depending on what state you live in, too. So, for example, we live in Michigan. We have date labels on prepackaged perishable foods and dairy. And once those dates pass in Michigan, you can't sell them. In Connecticut, they have the exact same dating laws, but you can still sell them after the label date. And then finally, New York, they don't really have any date label requirements on food. So the science is still the same no matter where you live, but it's up to the law. And that really is based on a history of our food production. We, you know, in the 1940s, most people knew where their food was coming from. They knew the nearby farm. They, you know, knew the store. They knew where it was coming from. And then, you know, as we started buying more food in grocery stores, we became more dependent. We didn't really know exactly where the food was coming from. Americans were like, well, hey, we want to know that what we're buying is actually safe, which is completely reasonable. So in the 1970s and really since then, states have developed their own laws and that has contributed to a lot of confusion. So there's a reason why the U.S. consumer consumes or wastes 10 times more than someone in Southeast Asia. And that's because some of these food laws and food labels can be really confusing. So let me go into this label idea. So I see a sell by or an expiration date. Are you telling me that literally if there's no pop up on the can, which means something went bad, that literally I could go a year past that date and it's okay? Yeah, it depends on what food. And we can dive into a little bit more of what contributors factor into this. But the dates that you see used by Best Buy, those are usually quality dates. So that's the manufacturer's or store's best guess. And this could be based on science too, but the best guess on their peak freshness and peak quality, but not safety. So there is that angle to this, right? Which is that maybe I've still got, you know, one of those boxes of uh, broth right in the pantry from Thanksgiving or something from last year. Right. So 
there's the expiration date or the use by, part of this could be a flavor issue, right? That sometimes things can diminish. And so there is that part of it, which I guess we have to think about. It may not be bad for you and it's not going to get you. Right. But it's just not what you wanted to add to your favorite gravy this time, you know. Right, right. And, you know, I have, uh, I recently bought a jar of sumac, which is a, you know, Mediterranean spice. And then I recognized, oh, crap, I still had one in the back of the pantry. So I'm looking at these two things of sumac. They're this bright, vibrant, kind of pinkish, reddish color. But the old sumac is like more brown, but it still tastes good. It's still not unsafe to eat. But again, it's that quality. It's not there. It doesn't taste as good. So that one to me is used for marinades and the new one is used for uh, vinaigrette. So, you know, you know, this is anecdotal. I have no research to back up what I'm about to say, but I think we've come through a time. I'll reference my both my wife and I have lost our parents, but we have parents that went through the Depression era. There's a bit more of a frugal nature to what they do. I think they went past some of those dates on canned goods and et cetera. I remember <laughs> with our kids, we went to pick them up from being with grandma and grandpa babysitting and the kids were driving home and they said, grandma gave us cheese with mold on it. We're like, what? Oh yeah. She just scraped the mold off and gave it to us. Well, uh, the kids were fine. I think we've come from a time where we were a little more frugal and maybe we wanted to make sure we could still eat. We didn't want to waste it to your point about wasting millions of pounds of food. Yeah. And now we're kind of sensitized like, oh, man, if it just if it's two days past, it's got to go. And right. You're encouraging us to think a little more deeply about that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely say trust your nose, trust your eyes and trust your tongue. Right. So it comes down to those few things, because if we can't necessarily trust expiration dates, then we need to pay attention to that. So if something smells off, that's your number one indicator to throw it out. If it looks off, if like the texture doesn't look the same, if you're looking at a sauce that looks like it shouldn't really look that way, you can toss it out. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, if something tastes off, you should throw it away too. But there's some rules of thumb that you can keep in mind. You know, generally meat shouldn't be kept for more than four days. Usually side dishes, once you've cooked them, shouldn't be kept for more than five days. So you can keep things like that in mind. And the USDA Food Keeper app is actually a really helpful app that tells you how long things should be stored and how to store them to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, but back to this food waste conversation, this is something that's really serious. And I think that's why it's so important for people to be informed about this is because 30 to 40 percent of all U.S. food supply is wasted. Now, we know that a lot of the waste happens at the farm level, happens at manufacturing happens in the grocery store, but 40% of all that waste happens in the home. Wow. And, you know, I mentioned that 80% of Americans are throwing away perfectly good food because of this confusion. So that means that, according to the UN, there's about 219 pounds of waste per person per year. Of cooked food or that you're in, are you including things in like general. canned goods? Food in general. Okay. Yes. And so that's like an individual, every single person in the U.S. throwing away 650 apples into the garbage. That's how much food that is, right? And there's more than just the wasteful component, right? Like we understand that we want people to benefit from food. We know that there are a lot of people who are food insecure in our country, but then there's also an environmental component. So 22% of what's in the landfills here in the U.S. is food. And of course, that's devastating to think about all that food going to waste. But that food also produces a lot of methane gas, which is a really potent greenhouse gas leading to, you know, environmental problems. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. What we do in our home can definitely make a difference, not only to our wallet, not only to food access, but also to the environment. Well, and then there's that piece about donating food, right, which can tend to whether it's food banks, food shelters, whether it's directly to somebody in need. But I think I've come to find that the people I know who were in the restaurant business, and if you've overcooked meals at home, short of you getting in your car and going and giving them to somebody, they bump into a liability issue. Right. Of don't, you know, like leftover pizza. They can't just give it away. They could give away the makings and the cans and boxes, but they can't do that. So I suspect that's part of this waste issue that we haven't been able to solve yet because a lot of restaurants per se... Well, they don't want the liability. They just don't want the food to go out and then some nice person picks it up and forgets that it's in the trunk and then gives it away six hours later and somebody gets sick. You know what I mean? Right. So it is complicated, to your point. 
It is complicated, and it also is different based on which state you live in. So even donation laws differ yeah. from state to state. But going back to what we can do, right? Because we understand that there's a lot of waste. We can't necessarily trust that once this date on our ham passes, we throw it away, right? Hopefully this can like <laughs> help some people. <laughs> yeah. Domestic arguments out. <laughs> I feel like we've we've all had that like, no, this should be thrown away. No, we should keep it. But as a rule of thumb, the way that things are stored is very important. So refrigeration, of course, inhibits the bacterial growth of a lot of harmful bacteria. And the colder that gets i.e. the freezer, the more we're going to prevent that mold and bacteria from forming. So the way I like to think about it is like, if I were a bacteria, where would I like to live? So <laughs> yeah, okay. I would want to live in a moist environment with some oxygen and, and some fat and sugar and things to feed off of, right? You're right. So those are things that are going to be the most likely to spoil and things that you want to pay extra attention to keeping. But things like your flour, sugar, a lot of those pantry staples, those are going to be fine possibly years after the expiration. So that's something to think about. Another thing to consider too is like plastic. Most plastic is gas permeable. So over time, even something in something that's stored in plastic can be affected by its surroundings. Oh, interesting. Versus a glass container or something. Right. So glass typically is going to last longer. And then finally, metal is what's going to be the safest. That's why canned foods are so great. And, you know, that canned food thing, it reminds me now that our kids are grown and they've got their own kids, we don't buy like we used to. I mean, you know, as somebody with the family of five children... Our job was to go out and when the, you know, give peas a chance, you know, it sounds like a 60s song. I think it was give peas a chance. When we would buy peas, we'd fall for that buy 10 for a, you know, I mean, you know, $10, <laughs> right? Yes. And so that we've got 10 cans of peas because we would use them. But I think looking back at our family history, I bet you we did get rid of some of those because it takes a minute to get through 10 cans of corn or something. Yeah. So- we're sort of being sensitized as consumers to overbuy, which can lead to overwasting. Absolutely. Uh, I think a good rule of thumb, too, is to think twice, like, what are you going to use this for and why I think meal planning and having a solid plan for the week ahead can reduce food waste because then you're you're thinking, OK, is this actually going to be used and you don't end up throwing food away because throwing food away is so sad, too. It's so sad just to think about it. But you, you know, the other shift that's happened to all of us, Shanti, is that we're you can pick your big box, you know, kind of wholesale type store. When you go in, you know, you, you just want a can of whipped cream for that thing and you have to come out with a 55-gallon <laughs> drum, you know, because yeah. that's the way, you know, it's like six boxes of Raisin Bran, you know. So it's just a, it's a hard thing to deal with when you're trying to bring home the value for your family's bottom line. Right. And you know you're going to use it eventually, but then you do stumble sometimes and you bought so much that it went bad or, you know, so I think we're... Got to find the balance. Yeah. yeah, we're getting turned in different directions now that we didn't used to. And it's also important to think about because, you know, I grew up with a family of four and we had certain behaviors as a family and we had, you know, a membership to those places where you could buy in bulk. And then now I'm living with one other individual and, you know, just that shift makes it not reasonable for us to have that kind of membership because we don't need to buy in those amounts. So, you know, just thinking twice about even having memberships like that, if it's necessary or not. The phrase that my wife and I have adopted when the kids come in and they go like, you just have one can of blah, blah, blah in the pantry. It's like, it's just in time delivery for us now. You know, we, we <laughs> yeah. just really, we go buy it if we kind of know it's going to be in a recipe or something is in the pea soup in the crock pot or, you know, whatever it is, we try to do that. When you're looking at food waste, so refrigeration is a big deal. You talked about bacteria, but there are still things we store, I am right now in the pantry in a dark place. So it could be potatoes, sweet potatoes, onions. Is our sniffer, is that the best line of defense that we walk in and we smell something's kind of turning or what should we be looking for when it's things that are not necessarily locked up in a can or in a you know container in the fridge? Yeah. So if the texture looks off, that's definitely one thing that you want to look for. I know I mentioned that previously. You want to look for any color too that's changed. So of course we know that mold sometimes will be like green or blue, but it can also be white. So just using your eyes to determine that. My fiance is colorblind, so that's my job around here. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, there's also a lot to storing things properly. We talked a little bit about that gas permeability and things, but there's also 
gases in fruits and vegetables. So the two things to keep in mind here is that there are fruits and vegetables that produce this gas called ethylene. And then there's also fruits and vegetables that are really sensitive to it. So ethylene gas is this odorless, colorless gas, and it triggers maturity in fruits and vegetables. So that means that it's going to continue to ripen in the presence of that. But for some fruits and vegetables, they can also just result in like wilting in the presence of this gas. So whenever we're storing things, we need to think about if they're giving off this gas or not. So for example, bananas, melons, apples, tomatoes, avocados, those are going to give off a lot of this ethylene gas. So we don't want to combine those in the same storage area as those that are sensitive. So for example, your broccoli, cucumbers, cauliflower, because those are either going to wilt, they're going to turn a different color like yellow, or they're just going to plain go bad. And that's because of those ethylene gases. So I like to keep those separate. Leave the ones that are really sensitive in your crisper drawer where they can still have some ventilation, but then keep your things like apples and avocados and things, things like that in the fridge away from them. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. So as we take a look at, uh, and we've probably got a whole other segment down the road for how <laughs> we could personally recycle in our backyards heading into spring, right? That right. we can compost. I mean, there are people who do that. On, my brother is big on that up north. So we'll, we'll get to that at some point, but wrap it up for us and start to give us the takeaway bullet points that we should be thinking about when it comes to literally opening up our cabinets and pantries and fridges today. What should we be looking for? And then you can calm our spirit and and, uh, let us know what not to be worried about, I guess. Yeah, so don't be worried too much about your pantry staples, like your baking supplies. Okay. When it comes to your fridge, generally your salad dressings and things like that are going to last a few months longer. Vacuum sealing your food can extensively elongate the shelf life, especially in your freezer. So if your frozen meat and veggies last about six months to a year, vacuum sealing them can make that two to three years. And that's because it prevents moisture from leaving. And you're also preventing moisture from getting in and making it freezer damaged. Making the most of your herbs, you can roll them in paper towel and then put them in a zipped bag and remove the air and that'll make them last longer. And then finally, just put things in the front of the fridge that you want to make sure that you use. So out of sight, out of mind, out of mind is a big phrase here because if it's in the back of your fridge, you're likely not going to see it and it might go to waste. And even though you've advised us, and for good reason, not to worry as much about the expiration dates, do you suggest the same thing in the pantry? If I've got three cans of uh, corn, move the ones forward that have the earliest date. Is that just a good way to keep that just-in-time assembly line going? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a good way to look at it. And, you know, while we don't want to pay attention too much to expiration dates and things like that, when you go to the store, of course, it's the best idea to choose the ones that have the latest date, right? Yeah. It works for milk all the time because every once in a while that sneaks in now, you know, <laughs> where somebody snuck in one that expired yesterday. Well, Shanti, it's good to see you as always. Thanks for all the good stuff. Thanks so much, Jack. We'll see you next time. Oh, you're very welcome. And we want to uh, thank Shanti. And Shanti, by the way, is a registered dietitian, the health and wellness spokesperson for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. And she's got an extensive background, Bachelor of Science in Nutrition. So uh, she's forgotten more than we know about this topic. And so we have appreciate all that you gave us today. We appreciate you being here as well. Thanks for listening to a Healthier Michigan podcast. It's brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. If you like the show and you want to know more, check us out online at a healthiermichigan.org slash podcast. You can also leave us reviews, ratings on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. If you want new episodes, old episodes, uh, you can get them for your smartphone, tablet, Be sure to uh, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I'm Chuck Gatica. Be well.